William L. Whiffler was ordained an Episcopal priest in 1955, and in that same year he married Pauline Papperman, a high school English teacher. They served as missionaries in the Dominican Republic from 1955 to 1963, and then in Costa Rica from 1964 to 1966. In 1967, Reverend Whiffler began his work at the National Council of Churches, Caribbean, and Latin America Department, becoming director of that department in 1968. From 1977 to 1988, he served as director of the National Council of Churches Human Rights Office. In 1978, Reverend Whiffler received his PhD from Union Theological Seminary, New York, New York. Actually, at that time, uh, she had majored in um, English composition of literature and teaching English, um, and did actually teach English on a graduation from Wilson College, which is down in Pennsylvania. Uh, she taught there in a place called Westminster, high school students. And then we were married after she was only there for a year. She came to New York for a year and we were married. That same year, he and Pauline were appointed as missionaries to the Dominican Republic, which Bill had visited as a seminarian. Later that year, 1955, he was ordained a priest in the Dominican Republic. We arrived in the Dominican Republic uh, in September of 1955. Okay, and you were assigned to a parish uh, as an assistant, or were you in the, the beginning? Uh, my <laughs> colleague, uh, who, the man who became a, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Phil Wheaton, had been there three years. Was on furlough with his family, um, and uh, I, I, for three months, I was filling in his mission station in uh, Ciudad Trujillo, the old Santo Domingo. In 1997, the Dominican Episcopal Church celebrates its 100th birthday. For the first 55 years, most services were conducted in English, but change began with a new round of missionaries headed by the Reverend Philip Wheaton, James Douglas, and William Whiffler in the 1950s, whose goal was to nationalize the church, enhance its native Dominican Republic quality. Then at the end of that time, I became one of two uh, really circuit-riding priests in San Pedro de Macorís, which was the second largest city in the Republic. Uh, we attended to seven congregations every week uh, between the two of us, put a lot of miles on our cars. One of those became my principal responsibility. That was in La Romana, All Saints Church La Romana, where I was sent to um, build a new church, a new uh, uh, rectory, and uh, a new school. In the Dominican Republic during the time of Trujillo when it was a major uh, crisis um, occurring during those years and Trujillo was uh, sacrificing a good deal of the population for his own purposes. Uh, actually I got on a death list in 1961 as a result of my own concerns about human rights when I was there as a missionary.
I became a missionary in the Dominican Republic in 1955, and it was, uh, the time was very interesting because 50, 1955 was the height of the Trujillo regime, the, degrade, the ferocious dictator who was the head of government in the Dominican Republic. And how did um, being a pastor during the Trujillo regime lead you to come across human rights problems? One of the things that uh, Trujillo could not accept was any kind of overt opposition. And uh, there were times when the pressures were on him for a variety of reasons. And he took it out on segments of the population, often young people who didn't restrain themselves as they were supposed to, being loyal Trujillistas. Mm -hmm. And so I'd find myself in the police station or down at the military barracks trying to uh, get one or two or five young people released, some from my church, others from the community. But it was a habitual practice. It was happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was obvious that uh, the things I was doing demonstrated an opposition to the mechanisms that were being used by the government against the population. I didn't overtly speak about it, but my actions, I think, kind of revealed where I was in regard to the government. November 19th of that year, 61, my name appeared on a death list for our community. And it was uh, by the grace of God and the action of some young um, officers in the Air Force who stopped the killing, who wouldn't permit it, and who threw the, the family of Trujillo out of the country, that actually my life was saved at that moment, along with about, I understand it was almost a thousand people across all of the Dominican Republic who would have been assassinated that night. Do you know how your name got on that death list? Well, it was partially because I, after Trujillo died, I became less cautious about things I said. And, uh, Government kept lists, and so I think that probably uh, there was a nucleus of us. There were 22 people in the town who were really trying to help foster a democratic perspective on politics, on uh, culture, on life in, in that community. And um, my name probably was right there. The landslide election of a man by the name of Juan Bosch. He was a social democrat. And he uh, was elected uh, in the fall of 19, or the winter of 1962, in November or December, and took office in 63, and uh, was a reformer. He wanted to do land reform. He wanted to do things with uh, uh, marriage and divorce laws that were more liberal, et cetera. And a coalition of um, the Roman Catholic Church leadership and the oligarchy of the country and the military were opposed to the kinds of things that he was creating, and he was deposed. Mm -hmm. And that's when we left, actually, from the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, because friends said that the Trujillistas were going back in uh -huh. and that it would possibly be dangerous for me and my family to stay, and we left. Bill, Pauline, and their four children, John, Anne, Sarah and Mark lived in Costa Rica from 1964 to 1966, where Bill served as an Episcopal missionary. In 1966, the family moved to New York. Bill served as director of the National Council of Churches, Caribbean and Latin America Department, and later as director of the NCC Human Rights Office. So, Phil, when did you first meet Bill? Phil, when did you first meet Bill? <laughs> well, I met him when we were in the Dominican Republic, and he came down as a missionary uh, about four or five years after I had been there. Okay. And we were in different uh, places. Okay. And you were both uh, pastors, priests of the Episcopalian Church right? On, as missionaries in the DR. Right.
this was later when Bill was uh, in New York and working for the National Council of Churches. He and his wife Pauline were quite a presence uh, there. She was on the city council on a Long Island town. Bill's motto was, yes we can, not no we can't. And he lived that to the hilt. I've always loved Bill's uh, spunk. He's, you're right, he's a, a tremendously warm and pastoral. He's also a daring do uh, guy. I think he was probably most vulnerable when he lived in the Dominican Republic under Trujillo and on the death list. So did you get to know I loved Pauline. Pauline pretty well? I loved her. I didn't get enough time with her, but the little bit I did have, we had some weekends together at their cabin up in the... Uh, um, in New York, and she was a sparkly-eyed, warm, very bright person, loved people, and her students loved her. She was uh, quite a presence as a teacher and as a leader in the, in the uh, she started the community as being a member of the board of this little town where they lived on Long Island. So before uh, she was stricken with Alzheimer's, so sadly, um, yes, she was, she was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think she uh, shared Bill's political views and his passion for justice in Latin America as well as totally. in the U.S.? She, totally. So they were, a team they were a team in that regard, supporting one another Absolutely. in their work and their commitments. Yes.